Buenos días. Iniciamos la penúltima mesa redonda de estas jornadas eh, sobre el vínculo de la industria del videojuego con otros mundos virtuales. A lo largo de esta mesa se tratarán distintos temas como eh, la importancia del metaverso, inteligencia artificial, nuevas tecnologías, simuladores, así como también la relevancia de los sectores transmedia dentro de la definición en la actualidad del propio sector del videojuego y el desarrollo de nuevos géneros y productos. Va a moderar Iván Lobo como secretario general de Dedicat. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Héctor. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. I will pretend that I can see you all with the lights. Um, thanks for joining this panel. Uh, my name is Ivan Fernández Lobo, and yes, I'm General Secretary of, of the BICAT, that is the Catalonian Games Association, but I'm also the founder of Game Lab. There is an independent industry uh, platform and think tank that has uh, 20 years already and that gets together some of the most amazing talents and, and leaders of our industry to discuss um, things that are, uh, or, or that they think they are important for our industry and for our medium. And it's a big pleasure for me also as, a, as an ex-developer and uh, academic uh, to be sharing this panel with five amazing profiles, uh, very diverse profiles, Uh, with different experiences uh, around virtual worlds um, that I would ask uh, and I would ask them to introduce themselves instead of doing a bad introduction myself I prefer that you take a, uh, just a, a short time in to briefly introduce yourself and to explain a little bit how your experience and your work And, and that of your organizations relate to the topic of the panel today of virtual worlds so I'm going to start always in this direction, uh, with uh, Professor Richard Bartel, if you want to explain a little bit about your... Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so um, I'm uh, Richard Bartel. I'm a professor of computer game design at the University of Essex. Um, my connection with um, virtual worlds, the metaverse, whatever you want to call it, goes back to 1978, when I and a friend as an undergraduate, aged 18, Um, co-wrote the first one, which was called MUD, Multi-User Dungeon. So basically, I know more about virtual worlds than you. <laughs> uh, because I've, never, I've, I've worked on them ever since. Um, as you can tell by my disheveled appearance, it's not a profitable um, activity, but nevertheless, it's one that I've devoted my career to and expect to devote the rest of it to as well. We're not passing it around. <laughs> Hello, uh, Anne Becker. I work for Video Games Europe, former uh, ISFE. Uh, and uh, my, my connection to virtual world is, of course, that our membership, video game companies, virtual worlds is nothing new. Uh, it's been existing for a long time uh, in, the video game, uh, in the video game sector. Uh, and how I mostly interact with it is... Uh, a little bit of gameplay, but also uh, the European institutions keeps us quite busy, also with regulation, whether that is on AI, and we've just seen a, uh, a communication on the metaverse, the virtual world from the European Commission this week, actually. Eh, bueno, soy Lorena González, eh, cofundadora de Immersiva XR, que es la Asociación de Realidad Extendida de España, así que al final pues mi conexión con los mundos virtuales es muy, muy cercana porque lo que ahora llamamos mundos virtuales también desde la asociación consideramos que pueden ser pues, otro tipo pues, de experiencias ¿no? de realidad virtual. Eh, así que llevamos como también un montón de años con un montón de empresas eh, trabajando en, en la creación de estos, de estos mundos virtuales. Y, y bueno, básicamente lo que hacemos desde la asociación pues es conectar a todas estas empresas profesionales que se dedican a, a la realidad extendida y también pues eh, dar visibilidad tanto a lo que es la tecnología en sí como a, a todo, todos los proyectos, eh, empresas, iniciativas que se están desarrollando. Hello, uh, my name is Henrik Johnson. My uh, journey into virtual worlds started about a decade after Richard Bartels uh, designed the first MUD game. Uh, I started playing the MUD games and I lost my, uh, gra I didn't graduate because of the MUD games. However, I did 
did learn to program uh, a C-like language called LPC, which one of the MUDs were written in, and that was my ticket into the games industry. Um, many years later, I worked in a, at a technical company making simulators, and we were working on something called digital plant technologies. Basically, your, the idea was that you build up your industry, your factory in, uh, in the computer, and you can uh, map out all your uh, shop floor activities. Uh, this failed uh, magnificently in one of the first dot-com crashes uh, of the uh, 1999. Um, but so much technology got into this that they are still doing cool things uh, in other ways, that company. Later years, I've been working as an investor, so I've seen a lot of companies um, present their cases around. Some do want to go into virtual worlds directions. Um, but uh, so far, it has been rather sad. So let's talk about the, the, op the opportunity and the uh, optimism uh, with not the sadness so much. Thank you. Hello. Oh, okay, now. Um, hello, my name is Kinga Palinska and I'm a senior legal counsel at CD Projekt Red, um, Polish uh, developer behind uh, franchises like The Witcher and Cyberpunk 2077. And um, I'm also supporting, uh, in any way I can, uh, various endeavors of the Polish Game Association. And uh, I'm very happy to be here with uh, such amazing co-panelists and uh, host. Uh, my uh, adventure with uh, virtual worlds is connected to me working as a lawyer in a video game studio. But uh, uh, what I really like about it in particular is that, you know, we have all those big concepts like generative AI, a transmedia, a user involvement when we're talking about virtual worlds that I can actually see from the business and operational level in my daily work. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, uh, to start uh, the, you know, the, the questions of the panel with a uh, uh, wondering if we have a consensus about what a virtual world is uh, in general, but in particular in this in this in this panel. So, taking advantage of having a true pioneer here, maybe uh, you would like to explain a little bit from your perspective and then from your other perspectives, complement it. Uh, what what we can we consider a virtual world? What is a virtual world? If you have to explain it to. Uh, well, citing from the well-known book Designing Virtual Worlds by Richard Bartle, um, <clears throat> you, you can download it for free now. <laughs> it's from 2003. It's very old. It's free now? I, yeah, yeah. I paid for it in, in the 90s. Well, 100,000 people <laughs> downloaded it in two weeks after I made it free. So if only they paid me, I wouldn't be here. Um, <laughs> So, um, so anyway, um, basically, um, <laughs> the definitions are whatever you want them to be in order to get funding. But essentially, it's a world which is persistent. So when you stop playing, the world's still there. It's shared so other people can go in there and what they do to the world affects everybody else. You interact with the world th um, through an individual character rather than lots of characters or some godlike being. Um, it's not the real world, um, because otherwise that would fit the definition. Uh, and there's another um, point as well, which I'm sure if I had my slides here, I would show you. But um, since you're not my undergraduate students, I'll just have to um, pretend that I've forgotten it instead of admitting I've forgotten it. But basically, there's about five or six different conditions. Uh, it's a shared world. You've got to be able to interact with the world and the people in it through the virtual environment. How you access the virtual environment isn't particularly important. At the moment, VR glasses would be a great way to do it. But it, and you don't need that. People do it on 2D screens. People can do it through text, which is how we started originally, because that's all we had. But... You don't, it, it, it's the world itself rather than the interface to the world that's important. And people go to the game world, or it doesn't have to be a game, people go to the virtual world because of what's there 
not because of the interface. I mean, if 3D was the reason people went into the virtual world, well, they wouldn't bother because the real world's 3D. So, you know, it's pretty good, actually, pretty good 3D. So you don't need to um, go into a virtual world to experience that. What you need is a reason to go in there. And that's probably what um, we'll be investigating later in, in this um, panel. Anyway, talk too much. Do any of you have any other perspective or complementary perspective that... Yep. Yeah, I would, uh, one of the earliest uh, mud types of games that I played, also text-based, was called a uh, mush, a multi-user shared hallucination. And I think that, was, that is pretty much exactly what this is. This is, we agree that we do something together and we agree that it's not real. We agree that it's different from the reality and hopefully we, we get some fun and entertainment out of it. Of course, when we go into a more serious direction, we want to be able to uh, purchase things, change things in the real world through these, this shared hallucination. But we all agree that the limitations of the systems that we use, the VR goggles or the text interface that we use, are... Um, they have limitations and we all agree that those limitations can be ignored. We, we say that, oh, you kicked me. Well, I didn't. I wrote, I kick you, basically. That, that is not the same thing, but we agree that that is the mode of operation, the mode of interaction. So, I, uh, apparently, I kicked you, if I write that I kick you. Um, or hug, and we can be more kind. Um, I was going somewhere. Yeah, so basically any application, to me, any application where we are collaborating or, or using, uh, in changing things together is a virtual world. Uh, it's just that we call it something different um, when we actually use it. We go into Figma or, or any type of super collaborative uh, environment, um, but it's a virtual world. It's just not as cool as <laughs> we're not looking to get funding for it <laughs> as Richard said so yeah that's it for me and what, and what is the well I don't know if you you wanted to say something too eh, no. sí bueno es que a ver desde el punto de vista de la realidad extendida para nosotros como los mundos virtuales son mucho más allá de lo que han dicho o sea también puede ser eso pero eh, también tenemos una perspectiva como de realmente que sí puede estar relacionado con nuestro mundo real o sea, por eso también lo del de hecho de que fueran en 3D no o sea que creo que sí que es un punto importante porque realmente la idea de esto es como poder crear eh, como un poco un digital twin de del, del mundo real o sea un gemelo virtual del mundo real o no necesariamente puede ser otra cosa totalmente inventada aparte si nos es útil o entretenida pero que también pueda eh, eso estar conectado con nuestro mundo real para poder ampliar nuestro mundo real. Entonces, ese mundo virtual no es que, digamos, que esté como desconectado y vaya a ser como el típico ejemplo que todo el mundo pone de Ready Player One, sino todo lo contrario, sino bajarlo a casos reales de, o sea, de uso de nuestro día a día, que no sean útiles o que no sean entretenidos y, y que podamos eh, realizar acciones en esos mundos virtuales de la manera eh, más orgánica posible. O sea, por el tema de lo de las interfaces y todo eso, que efectivamente pues queda mucho por desarrollar, pero ya no estamos interactuando con texto e incluso no hace falta tener unas gafas de realidad virtual eh, para poder acceder a, a estos mundos, sino que ahora mismo también se están considerando mundos virtuales como, eh, como si fueran una especie de videojuegos, ¿no? como una web, eh, os accedes a través de la web, a través incluso de tu ordenador o de tu móvil y, y ves un mundo en tres dimensiones, interactúas con tu avatar propio, etcétera, que bueno, son cosas de las que creo que hablaremos, pero que, que realmente creo que, o sea, que la visión a futuro va mucho más allá ¿no? de lo que tenemos ahora. What do you think are the best examples of virtual wars that we, we have seen already? What, in what is the stage that we are at this moment uh, in terms of the, the development of virtual wars? Um, who wants to take this, this question? So um, I believe we are at the moment of exploration. 
Uh, as we could see in recent months, different endeavors were uh, more or less successful, were taking a different path from originally planned. Uh, at the same time, I still believe that whenever we are uh, participating in various conferences, events, whenever we're talking about the definition of virtual words, it is different depending on who you ask, and the means to achieve it are also, they also vary. So I think that right now we have, I would compare it to this moment before a jump. You have this, we're taking the breath and this is in a perfect moment for us to think about how we want to do it, uh, what we want to achieve, uh, what uh, dangers we have to be prepared for and how to mitigate uh, any risks that we can already think of. Mm -hmm. um, in do you think that games are uh, inevitably evolving into virtual worlds? Do you think that is uh, something that is happening? And if, if that's happening, why? Yeah, I mean, happy to, uh, happy to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I mean, as you said, Richard, it's nothing new. It's, it's been there for, for quite some time. I think what what we are seeing now, of course, there's a lot of hype around virtual worlds, metaverses, but just follow up what Kinga just said, every time you speak about it, you do have a different de definition. And sometimes when we as a trade body even ask our members just to have a little bit of internal capacity building, we also get answers like, well, we don't think that exists, or what is a metaverse, etc. But they're happy to talk about what they are doing. So I think it's very individual in how you see that as a, uh, in, in, in our membership, which are the video game companies. But what we're seeing in terms of virtual worlds, and that is that the technology that video game companies have developed, whether that is a game engine, whether that is design, etc., we increasingly see how these technologies can benefit other sectors. Uh, you mentioned digital twins, I think, uh, at least in the translation. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think th this is something where we see how, for instance, our members' technology are being used, for instance, by transport authorities uh, in how they're doing urban planning before rolling out a railway, a new railway route, for instance. Uh, we recently had that example in the European Parliament, for instance. We have also seen the 3D model of uh, Notre Dame Cathedral uh, for the rebuild, etc. So I think what, what we're currently seeing is, is those sort of usages, subsequent usages, to bring innovation or advance other sectors by bringing uh, the technology that the video game sector has been using for, for quite some time and further sophisticated. Uh, so... What other opportunities do you think that virtual worlds can, can bring us uh, as a society? Uh... Um, well, there's the, the ones we've just heard of, the, the spin-offs, which you get. Um, I mean, games have always been um, at the forefront of technology. Um, the reason your um, computer at home is so powerful isn't so that it can run spreadsheets, it's so it can run games. Um, that's what's driven um, the technology. The only other one, things that do it, is the military. Um, so, um, on, on the technical side, yes, we, games have got a lot to offer. On the social side, well, they're, they, they offer people freedom. Um, the, the freedom to be and become themselves. Um, when you're playing a virtual world, um, it, it, it doesn't have to be a multiplayer one. Oh, I remembered what the other... Um, point was it was um, automated. The, the virtual world has to be automated, otherwise Dungeons and Dragons would be a virtual. Anyway, never mind that. Um, the, um, for society as a whole, I mean, it does offer many things to individuals because if you're trapped in a real world and you really don't like it because it sucks and pretty well does. I mean, I don't know who designed this world, but it's not a good design. They wouldn't have made those lights shine in my eyes for a start. Um, but <coughs> the um, individuals are constrained by the world around them, by the people, by their physical condition, by society, by their parents, their family, their workmates. All these pressures are coming in and people always have to adapt and conform to these views of them that other people and the environment has, which don't 
match their own internal views of themselves. And when you play games, you can throw that aside. You can be yourself. And if you don't know who you are, you can play games and find out who you are. So that's ultimately what society gives people. It gives people the freedom to be. Um, now, um, that's not the kind of thing that you can then go to the European Commission and say, um, give us some money so we can make people be. Um, they're not going to um, they're not going to hand money over for that, but ultimately that's why people would play games. It's and we can spin t tales about, oh, it's great for education, give us some money so that we can teach people to learn Spanish. Didn't really work in my case, but still. Um, or we can give um, money uh, to, to help people, disadvantaged people, um, learn how to interact with uh, um, therapists and so on. We can do all these things, but ultimately what people want from games is that freedom, that individuality, that personal sovereignty, that so they can be who they are or find out who they are or at least not be who everybody else thinks they are. Um, so, um, yeah, sorry to have suddenly got philosophical on you there, but um, that's, um, that's what I think games do bring to society and that's why no matter what um, rules um, they bring out in UK, China, US, EU, people will still play games because bears play games. It's, games are older than any art form that we have except perhaps singing and dancing because birds do sing. But um, yeah, they're better than literature, they're older than literature, so in your face literature. <laughs> um, anyway, um, sorry, I, I, you didn't want me to rant, so I'll stop. How do you see virtual worlds evolving? What is like the, n the next frontiers for, for virtual worlds? I can go real quick there. I think that we are needing to bring a couple of things together um, and solve a couple of, of areas. If we don't want to talk about talk games, uh, we usually get technology and games what do you call it? They mixed, mixed up. Games are entertainment. Uh, technology usually solves problems in, in the world. Uh, and if we want to start moving in that line um, between those two, when we do, uh, when we do these uh, interactive travels, I would, I would love to have gone here virtually before uh, this trip, so I wouldn't get lost on my morning walk down to the beautiful harbor. Um, but these are the kind of things that our game technology uh, could assist us with travel to different locations without having to uh, go to you know through airport security five times and etc. Um, there are the next steps to create things to solve. I think would be around payment and interaction with other people. Uh, anyone who has pl played video games online uh, or uh, visited Reddit or Twitter know that people are awful. Uh, and when they get together in, in, in a room without the constraints of civil, uh, civil appearance, people tend to be terrible <laughs> to each other. There's uh, many nice people out there, and then there's a few bad apples that make things terrible. And if we can find a way to, to solve that and to solve nice ways to pay people for, to do things, to support us across borders with, with making taxation, without making taxation a massive hurdle, for example. We want to solve things around uh, working together internationally across borders. JP talked about uh, reducing the cross-border problem problems that we have. Working together in a virtual world could be a solution to that, but there's, it's still difficult. There's still working remotely, it's still tricky. Um, so there's a couple of areas, domains, like there's not one frontier of, of things that we can solve and move forward along. There are many frontiers and we're kind of moving towards something that ultimately together could be some sort of metaverse slash virtual worlds thing. Uh, but it's not gonna look like what major tech companies have envisioned uh, very recently and then shut down. Can I build on uh, what Henrik said? So. Uh, a chance that I see in, in developing virtual worlds, coming back to the previous question, is the development of legal services. 
because uh, virtual worlds uh, do not only leave cer uh, uncertainties in, 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 in case of taxation payments, but also legal stuff. And this is actually also where I see an opportunity for uh, our sector because uh, many developers, and I'm not talking about the biggest ones who are actively uh, working on metaverse or virtual worlds in this way or another, but almost any uh, video ga the game developer has to deal with stuff we might be struggling with in case of virtual worlds. These are toxicity. There are multiplayer games that uh, handle this uh, kind of behaviors. And of course, I'm not saying that everyone at the game dev uh, sector has figured everything out, but there are some things we can uh, talk about and share our experiences. There is uh, transmedia and cross-licensing. So basically making sure that the character from one game can be uh, accessed by players of a different game. So this is also something that will be an issue if we come to this very uh, advanced uh, virtual world where you can take your avatar or take your item, virtual item, from one place to, to the other. So there is this whole like intellectual property issue. So how to protect the IP of the companies. So not only from the player perspective, but like the companies that invest resources into building brands or building certain IPs, franchises, and how to uh, make sure that uh, it's uh, used in a proper way and it's not abused or that they don't uh, lose it when we come with this one, uh, one big word. So there are other issues like cross-platform playing which can maybe uh, give some insights in terms, in terms of interoperability. And uh, user-generated content, how to deal with this stuff. Game dev is one of those sectors that is like very player-friendly. We are allowing uh, to people to modify our software by creating mods. We are usually supportive when it comes to creating some content, like fun, fun content. So there are many places and points where I believe that games can support the discussion on how to get where we want to, or even a step earlier, where we want to go with, with this kind of stuff. Yeah, so th thank you for that, Kinga. Um, and I think, uh, I think on man many of the points that, that you addressed there, and Henrik, you also mentioned toxicity, etc. And I think here we increasingly see how AI technology is being used, for instance, uh, to do live moderation of audio uh, through AI technology. So you actually take you know, away that uh, toxicity through keywords, et cetera, so on and so forth. So there is obviously a lot of technology. There's many things happening right now, I think. Uh, and I think that will also lead to, 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 to more innovation as well. Um, I mean, if I can just pause one minute, so I think it was Tuesday the European Commission came out with a communication uh, on virtual worlds, um, and I think that's quite interesting, it's really worth a read, and uh, uh, I think there, we're talking a lot about education, but I think what one really important point there is that the Commission has really put the um, talent pipeline as the very first point in that communication. I think that's really welcome. Uh, and, uh, and it shows that, uh, you know, that, that we, we, we have a bit of a vision there that that talent pipeline is really important. Of course, that communication is not only for, you know, video games, it's, it's a very horizontal text. And I think the second other really important point uh, that caught my attention is uh, also how it approaches the regulatory framework. So it's actually communication, not proposing any new rules, uh, but it looks at what we already have and makes that uh, conclusion that uh, we actually have a regulatory framework that is also fit uh, to deal with the virtual worlds. And of course, we currently have quite a few regulations that are under discussion, whether that is the AI Act, uh, whether that is the Data Act, whether that is the Cyber Resilience Act, all those things will, of course, also apply in that, uh, in that context of, of virtual world. Because sometimes you also hear that there are no rules. Um, you know, it's the wild, wild west. But in fact, no, it's not the wild, wild west. We, we do have quite, quite a few rules. Then it's, of course, about enforcement as well. Um, so. uh, can I just step in here and say, um, we do need 
to be able to protect game spaces. So um, it isn't the Wild West, but if I wanted to play a game that literally was the Wild West, then I should be allowed to do all kinds of things which are illegal. In the, you know, I should be able to own slaves. I should be able to shoot people because they're Indians. Now, these are very unpleasant things for us, but nevertheless, if I can watch a movie where that can happen and read a book where that can happen, I should be able to create a game where that can happen. Whether people would play it or not is irrelevant. It should be allowed, because otherwise you're, imp you're imposing a framework on developers that um, makes it, it takes away um, some of what they might want to express. Uh, and all these rules that come in, they can be for very good reasons, very well-meaning. It's just these side effects. Um, if you say um, things like, um, we've got to have rules, I mean, that Kinga just mentioned, for um, transferring property between virtual worlds. Well, game developers typically don't want that to happen. Um, they don't want, I mean, they don't even want to do it between their own worlds that they, that they own because it spoils the game. Now, if it's a world which is just an adjunct to reality and you want to move, it's like moving um, something from your Apple phone to your Google phone, well, yeah, okay, well, that's fine. But if it's a game world where this is a machine gun and I don't want a machine gun in my medieval world and I don't want you to trans form that machine gun into a medieval equivalent of a machine gun because they didn't have them, then, then you can't do that kind of thing. The, the, and, and so all these rules which are being imposed for being fair may not, in fact, be good in particular examples. So people should be able to, to opt out of them at the very least. Um, <laughs> creo que... Um, a ver aparte de lo que son como juegos, o sea, como lo que estamos entendiendo como mundos virtuales, como videojuegos, también tenemos que pensar que va a haber mundos virtuales, o sea, bueno, ya los hay realmente, más allá de lo que son los juegos. Entonces, eh, toda esta interoperabilidad que hablabais, eh, o sea, es verdad que tiene que haber como una especie de estándares, eh, regulación para que tenga sentido, pero... Eh, pero por lo menos desde el punto de vista como de aplicaciones a nivel pues industrial, médico, eh, social, eh, incluso pues mmm, como para eh, hacer eh, eventos o trabajar en el día a día como de otras aplicaciones más destinadas como a la productividad, eh, no tienen por qué, o sea, por qué haber este como tipo de problemas, ¿no? Eh, y que realmente pues como siempre como ya lleva muchos años haciéndose, eh, como lo que decíais, que venimos como de ese lado más de videojuegos, parece que es como lo primero que se nos viene a la cabeza y nos quedamos ahí. Pero eh, a mí me gustaría también como eh, ver esa otra parte como más hacia adelante de si, si todo esto eh, simplemente es, por eso justo lo que, lo que hablabas también Ann, del, del informe eh, que han sacado y de la, y de la comunicación que ha sacado eh, la Comisión Europea, realmente son mmm, las bases a partir de lo que ya hay y eh, no estamos inventando nada nuevo, sino que es una evolución de Internet, o sea, de la web 2.0 o 3.0 que tenemos ahora. ¿no? Entonces, eh, esta, esta evolución eh, o sea, creo que va a ser algo mucho más eh, fluido y paulatino de lo que a lo mejor ahora nos estamos pensando, ¿no? que era como, bueno, es que hoy estamos eh, delante de una pantalla y mañana ya vamos a llevar todos unas gafas súper futuristas o una lentilla o cosas así, cuando realmente eh, no va a ser así para nada. Entonces, eh, eso, que que me gustaría no perder de vista también eh, esa otra parte como más eh, de trabajo, de relaciones eh, interpersonales eh, y de eh, incluso educación, eh, que es comercio, que son temas que, que, que van a estar ahí presentes y que van a incorporarse o se están incorporando ya realmente a través también de pues eso, la inteligencia artificial, el blockchain, etcétera, dentro de estos eh, mundos virtuales. I think the common ground is that uh, we're talking about social platforms, human platforms, right? Uh, digital human platforms, in a way. And, and those challenges that you are, uh, and th those risks risk that, that you are addressing, um, they require um, evolution, technical evolution from the gaming companies. 
and potentially uh, they require conversation and, and, and frameworks and regulations maybe uh, that ensure that those things are protected in, 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 in these games and, and virtual worlds. To which point do you think that the, the, the industry creating these this platforms, these virtual worlds, is able to, um, to solve all these problems themselves or is the AI who is going to solve them or to which point do you think that governments should be um, you know, regulating or trying to, to work together with the industry to regulate certain things and make sure that these things, these things happen? You know? How, what is your, your uh, approach to that? So I can start on the legal side. Sorry for being boring, but uh, not sure I can talk about anything else. So I really think that when it comes to the legal side, we have so many things to consider that definitely there will be a cooperation between the legislators and the industry needed. Why cooperation? Because obviously the industry knows how things work and uh, can provide valuable feedback on uh, on the business, operational side, technical side as well. And uh, legislators, well, they constitute the law, so they are the ones who can make it all happen and make things possible. And like from the top of my head, like issues like if we have this platform, let's say, that is a um, virtual world, and let's say it's, uh, it's uh, something that anyone in the world can access, then like which law will be applicable? Will be, which law will be applicable in terms of in virtual world crimes? Um, like how will, will it, the enforceability look like if someone offends me or commits crime in a game, where should I go, to which court? Uh, will the court you know, understand my problem and uh, punish someone else? Uh, then you have the issue uh, between players of toxicity and uh, misbehavior, but also privacy and security of their data. Um, how are we, who will uh, take care of it? How are we going to do it? And then, as mentioned before, like this, let's say, a brand owner's level. So, like, uh, how are we going to make platforms or creators like uh, make sure that they allow others to use their platforms or software like interoperability are we gonna force people to do it if not then uh, like how we will make sure that this virtual world is a virtual world that is available on so many different levels uh, so i think it will come to balancing various uh, values as well not only interests and, uh, and legal issues, but in the end, values like creativity and uh, ownership. So, if I may pick up on, pick up on that, I, I think we're not, we're, we've been through a couple of years where there has been a lot of digital regulation. Uh, I, I see video game companies, small and large, I mean, the uh, compliance that everybody's currently doing through this enormous raft of legislation that's happened is, is enormous. So I, I, I thought it was quite refreshing to see that in the Commission's uh, virtual worlds communication that actually let, let's hold here. We think what we're having uh, that is actually adaptable, it's technology neutral, it will also work for these for these virtual worlds. And I thought that that's quite a healthy approach at the moment where we are now. And uh, I think it would be impossible to come out with regulation for this at the moment. First, I don't think it's needed. Uh, and second, for, for, what, for what specific purpose? Uh, of course, there will be challenges. And, and again, I think there are many things that, because virtual worlds have been in place since quite some time in the video game development, there is all, always, there is, I, I think at the moment there's quite a good experience in the video game sector, also for other sectors. How do you manage uh, players that kicks another one, etc., through content moderation, uh, through filtering? Through, you, you have lots of stuff in place, and here I think actually you, you can draw from that experience in the video game sector because they, they have obviously needed to be dealing with this for, for, for many years. I think, you know, one topic that we hear a lot about at the moment is age verification, you know, 
in the online world. How are we are we going to do that? Uh, is is that is that required? Is that needed? Uh, age assurance, age verification, etc. So so this seems to be something that is really you know on. Uh, on top of many, I would say, regulators' mind at the moment, and that also creates a lot of conflict in positions as well. Uh, so I think that we're going to have a, uh, you know, these, you know, discussions around virtual, around legal aspects, etc. It is going to be with us for some time, but at the moment, what we have just been through in terms of legislative initiatives, process, etc., uh, I, I think, you know, it's a welcome stop to say that, okay, we're probably at the good place now, let's see how we can, you know, work this out. Eric, very quick thing on top of this. Uh, I'm a very strong proponent of uh, industry self-regulation, and I think we have a perfect example of the PEGI system. I think Dirk is here somewhere, and I can't see anything. Uh, so, so we can strengthen the support and the industry support for the PEGI organization and the way we uh, label our games to make sure that we can work within that framework to avoid uh, legislation both on national and European levels, which always tends to be get in the way of creativity, uh, financial success, commercial success and uh, freedom of expression. Uh, so I think there is lots to do also within that uh, the self-regulation framework that can also be extended into a direction of virtual worlds when the games move or the uh, game applicable rule set moves towards more of a non-gaming but more virtual worlds. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Sorry, so, yeah, I completely agree. We don't need anything new. Uh, in, in case it wasn't clear, <laughs> uh, it's sufficient enough. But uh, building up on what was said today, but also yesterday, sometimes um, when we see uh, something new emerging, we need to make sure that the current legislation meets uh, the needs of this new element. So as it was mentioned on the example of games, that sometimes something made for more traditional audiovisual uh, industries like maybe filmmakers or literature does not always meet the needs of, of game industry. Uh, my point was here exactly the same that, you know, we as we are at the beginning of the path or like maybe not at the beginning, but we still don't know where it will lead us. Uh, we need to be prepared for, for various uh, actions. There is a danger that where we've stopped may be too far. Um, for example, um, if we look back way, way back into the past when we had text games, what happened was people created ones that were basically plug, plug and play. You could just take one and then change it into your own game. And these things might have between zero, 300 players. Now, at the moment, we don't have that for graphical worlds, but we could. And if you've got half a million people, each of whom have their own little virtual world running, you can't ask half a million people who are dealing with between zero and 300 players to do regulation. I mean, here at the moment, if I were to... Um, stab uh, Ivan, um, it wouldn't be the responsibility of this um, auditorium to stop me. It would be the police because it's too small for that. But if I did it in a football stadium, well, perhaps there would be some responsibility. They shouldn't have let me in with a knife. There were some guards around um, stewards who are watching behaviour who could have stopped me. So at some point, the movement goes from the police to this isn't really the police, this is for you to do. Now, if the regulation all says this is for you to do because at the moment you're all large companies, then what happens when it, people get their own little worlds coming out? Well, we're supposed to regulate them. Well, we can't because... You know, we don't know anything about it. We're just little people who've just bought them down because we're 16-year-olds and we want to play games with our friends. Um, so th the legislation will, like much legislation, be largely ignored by small people who it isn't worth suing. But the larger companies, it will apply to them. But nevertheless, the, pe 
people will be breaking the law because the law wasn't built for the current situation. So we may have to roll back some laws that we've got at the moment. You can't say that it, where we've got at the moment, yeah, it is a good place, but it won't always be a good place because technology, society will move on. Um, so just worry there. Muy rápido. Um, que, <laughs> creo que um, igual que ahora mismo la gente, o sea, perdón, lo, los reguladores no pueden entrar en casa de la gente, como lo que ocurre dentro de casa es muy difícil de controlar y por eso pues hay un montón de problemas que en principio están regulados pero que no se sabe qué ocurren. Entonces, si nadie que está dentro y lo está viendo y es testigo lo denuncia, no se hace nada. Eh, esto va a pasar parecido. O sea, si, claro, dentro de, como de si cada persona tiene su propio mundo virtual o genera su, como su propio contenido, eh, es algo que ya está ocurriendo también o sea, ahora como con cosas como que ya tenemos más normalizadas. ¿no? Si yo ahora mismo pongo un tweet o un thread cuando, cuando ya llegue a España, eh, eh, realmente, eh, como ¿de quién es la responsabilidad de haber puesto eso? Eh, ¿Por qué se genera ese eh, odio, por ejemplo, en esa red social? Eh, al final, también es, creo que es un tema de, de educación ¿no? y de que el, el, el mundo virtual en general, o online o ¿no? digital, nos, nos da como esa capa de protección, de decir, bueno, es que no soy yo el que está ahí, ¿no? es, es mi avatar. Pero ¿qué pasa? Que realmente es bastante gracioso como cuando entras a un mundo virtual con tu avatar, que puede representarte a ti muy fielmente o puede ser un plátano, eh, realmente estás eh, como mucho, la gente siente mucha más sensación de presencia, ¿no? como, como se llama, y, y eso hace que también te sientas más responsable de tus actos. Entonces, creo que frente a lo que a lo mejor se cree, eh, puede que tengamos hasta eh, suerte y esto nos ayude a que, a que eh, también to, pues, todos estos marcos regulatorios que ya existen y, y los nuevos, eh, no sé cómo se dice en español, eh, sandboxes que se están creando eh, como para poder ensayar estas situaciones, ayuden a que, a que no, no, no nos encontremos con estos problemas, sino que como ya es algo que ya vemos venir ¿no? y que por eso estamos hoy aquí, eh, y que eh, ya se viene trabajando desde hace tiempo a, a raíz de otras, otras situaciones y otros entornos que no son el mundo virtual final perfecto que vamos a tener, eh, esperamos, en algún momento eh, con todas estas características de las que hablamos, eh, pero que ya nos están sirviendo como para ver hacia dónde va a ir y podemos trabajar sobre ello y adelantarnos a esos problemas. Entonces, eh, yo tengo fe en ese futuro eh, para que lo hagamos bien porque lo estamos haciendo ya desde ahora. Let me ask you one, one last question before just uh, giving the opportunity to the audience to, to interrogate you a little bit more. Uh, let's talk about Europe. Um, do you think Europe is in a strong or a weak position regard, uh, um, for having an influence in shaping the future of, vir of virtual worlds? And, and why do you think it's, a strong, it's in a strong position or a weak position? How do you feel Europe's position regarding the, this influence in, in the evolution of virtual worlds? I would rank us as a weak second. We're second best in the world, I would say, when it comes to this. But we, are, we don't have the leading technology companies here uh, when it comes to the hardware. We're all playing our, our games and our virtual worlds on American hardware, basically. Um, the hardware makers will shape what direction the interfaces go, uh, but the content of the virtual worlds are software, which means that we have, uh, we're a strong position to control, uh, to make the software that runs the virtual worlds. However, the networks and uh, the walled gardens that we are seeing today are all American or uh, in one, uh, exception Japanese. Um, so I think that there is no other place where we will go. Uh, there was no one really to challenge us in our set position as second, but I don't think that we are in uh, any position to become first in quite some time. Um, completely agree. I mean, Europe does not have the big platforms on which video games are played, uh, but we're great at content creation. And uh, 
sometimes we still hear reflections, well, maybe we should invest and have a competing European platform, but um, the best strategic things is probably to invest in that content creation that Europe has in that fantastic, and I think you mentioned it also, a little bit also, Richard, that, you know, artistic freedom and expression that Europe is really good at. Uh, and also, you know, technology, technology is there, you know, there are things we can, we can do there. Uh, so I think focusing on those two things uh, is probably a good option for Europe uh, from a video game, from a video game sector space. Um, one thing I would like to mention, it's, it's a very boring topic, it's called ICT standardization. <laughs> but it's happening a lot in this space at the moment. Uh, it's not always attractive to read the ISO documents, IEEE, SEND documents, etc. But there is a lot of stuff happening there. And there are some regions in the world that have a very pronounced ICT standardization strategy uh, for 2035. And I think if Europe does not get into that race in order to make sure that, uh, you know, we do not have standards coming in that would aim to regulate freedom of expression, that would aim to regulate how we manage our IP, etc. I think that's absolutely, absolutely crucial. Uh, currently, we have national standards bodies uh, that are dealing with this, but we, it would be great if we could have a a coordinated approach when it comes to areas in Europe where we need obviously to stand strong on any, I would say, uh, thing that could uh, uh, limit the freedom uh, of uh, autistic creation and also that IP that's being created. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Just one thing I feel obliged to clarify because <laughs> yesterday and, and today we we're talking about um, platforms that in Europe we do not have platforms. They are all outside EU. So I'm aware that it's nowhere near the biggest platforms, but CD Projekt, Dotter Company, uh, GOG is a digital distribution platform. And so, yeah, we're there. It's a Polish based company. Uh, of course, we we are competing against big uh, players like like Steam, uh, but uh, yeah, there is something. So maybe there is uh, some pl some you know place in Europe also to to work around also those aspects. Great. Um, so I'd like to to get some questions from the audience. If you have any questions at this moment, I can see. I see there's one question here at least. Can we get a mic? Yeah. Right over here. Thanks. Thank you. Um, you already touched on briefly, um, but I want to expand on the question. Um, does, because you talked about the regulation for virtual worlds a lot, AI kind of ties into that. Does AI regulation go far enough? Um, I'm also partially looking for an answer on AI generated content, because if you want to populate these huge worlds, it's very, makes it very accessible to people who want to create stuff. What, what is the status there? Um, I'm mostly looking at you with your legal background, of course, but what, where, where, where are we going with the legislation on this? Well, so yeah, generative AI is a very interesting uh, topic and um, to be honest, at the moment, I feel that if we would really like to use it uh, extensively, we probably would have to kind of change our mindset on IP law in general, copyright and other laws. Because at the moment, uh, if I were to think about using AI in you know, something closer to me, so no, maybe not virtual world, but like in games, I see many risks related to it, starting from the fact that you might be uh, depending on the software you're using, you might be infringing someone else's copyright to the fact that what you create is in most cases not uh, protected. So especially from this uh, game developer perspective, when IP is the most crucial part of your uh, business apart from people, uh, when you're not able to protect it, then probably might not be the best idea to, to use it uh, extensively. And then you also have this aspect of, of trade secrets, uh, 
which I think it was Samsung that uh, d dealt with some leakage of data through one of the of the softwares. So I think we would have to really closely look and to what extent, to what purpose we want to use uh, generative AI. And uh, then probably at some point, I'm not say, saying anytime soon, uh, think how we want to approach copyright uh, protection in general in, in case we are posed uh, in front of you know, metaverse or virtual world that requires us to, to do it. Well, I think if we're talking about virtual world, it will be probably something that will have to be discussed uh, internationally. Uh, but when it comes to regulating it, I'm not so sure we should be so far going at the moment. Add to that real quick. Uh, generative AI, there's nothing dangerous around the copyright stuff as long as you train it on your own data. Uh, so game studios can can absolutely use it if they set up these are how we want our villages to look uh, and then let the AI create more of those kinds of villages. That's absolutely safe. There is no problem there, right? So use it how, how you it's the how not the what like if, if we can use AI or not is not a binary thing. It's how what we train the AI on that gets tricky. Uh, and if we own what we stick into the AI, then we own what comes out of the AI, basically. The, um, there is a... Um, you can't um, copyright gameplay. Um, it's a system. You can't, uh, it's, it can't be copyrighted, it can't be patented. Um, so there's nothing to stop someone from um, training their AI on every single game on the App Store. Um, of course, they might need to have access to the App Store, but of course, Google and Apple do. Um, and then just inserting their, their own IP into it. And from that, you could have millions of games being generated every day. Uh, and they'd all have interesting little names, and you'd think, oh, that one sounds quite nice. Um, Honey-eating snakes with pandas. That sounds pretty good. I'll try that. Oh no, it was the wrong kind of snake. But it doesn't matter if you've paid your 79 cents, to, to, um, it's gone. So we could find that app stores could be absolutely swamped with random games, which in my opinion would be pretty good because that would mean the end of the app stores. Um, but, but, so that's one issue with it. The other issue is um, if we use the generative AIs to... Um, role play the non-player characters in our games. Um, that means that the non-player characters are you know, little smart individuals and if we make sure that they don't know too much about the real world, so if we start asking them about who's going to win the World Cup, Women's World Cup, they're not going to know what we're talking about. But at some level, I mean, at the moment, people are saying, are these AIs smart or are they not smart? I mean, are they as clever as us or are they not? Give it 50 years. Give it 500 years. Give it a million years. doesn't matter how long you give it. We've got the rest of eternity. At some point, those little AI characters are going to be as smart as us or smarter than us. We have to decide in advance how we're going to treat them because as soon as they are as smart as we are, have feelings like we are, which we have given them, we've got to answer questions like, is it right for us to make these characters suffer? Is it right for us to give them a lifespan so they're going to die? Is it okay to switch off the computer so 10 billion of them all die? We've, we have to ask these questions now because those are the questions which, in the future, will have to be answered. And if we don't have an answer because we haven't thought about it, suddenly we're in the same position as we are now, except with chat GPT. People, oh yeah, yeah, it's, um, it, it looks like it's clever, but it isn't really, it's just a uh, long time. Um, if it really is clever and we haven't thought it through, well, we need to have thought it through. Okay, I would love to, to have uh, many more questions, but uh, we don't have time. 
please let me just uh, congratulate, uh, um, allow me uh, just a minute to congratulate uh, the Ministry of Culture in, in my country. I feel very proud that we are finally taking the lead in things like this. I think it's important because uh, as in Spanish, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, we always try not to get like a, uh, others to do things first. And I think in this, in this medium, uh, Spain is demonstrating that it that wants to be important and that can take the lead too. And I, I need to congratulate uh, the braveness and the, the, um, you know, the, the decision of the Ministry of Culture and the Spanish government to put video games at the European level uh, in, the, you know, in, 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 in the middle of the Spanish presidency. I think we, we, as the Spanish, we need to. I mean, we we need to feel proud. And, and thank you all for for joining us. Thank you.